Well, today we're going to talk, uh, continue our series on the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and ironically, I was assigned patience. Um, already had one comment from one of my Weisenheimer friends here this morning, not my wife, by the way, that it seemed a little bit ironic or whatever that I was actually teaching on patience. Uh, to which I responded, it's not my fault, it's all those idiots that provoke me. Um, and I was thinking about it, I mean, I've really been thinking about it. I was on my way home from the store the other day, and um, as you know, in Central Ohio, we've become fans of the, the uh, intersection roundabout. Um, when I lived at Dublin, I actually, the lady who bought our house is the deputy city manager. And I said I thought that it was the Dublin Department of Transportation fantasy that there would be a roundabout at the end of everybody's driveway, <laughs> uh, the way they like to put them in. And um, so this, this person insisted on going through them, and there are about six uh, on the road that I drive from the store to get home, and she insisted on going through them at about 2.1 miles per hour uh, with no traffic coming in any direction. So, if there was, it was long gone by the time she got to the, <laughs> to the place. And so that's how I came up with the title, Lord Give Me Patience, right now. Uh, let me just... Uh, read a, a little bit of Galatians chapter 5, then we'll discuss uh, patience and sort of the um, one area that I think we need to be careful about uh, in how we try to work through these, uh, these characteristics that are identified as the fruit of the Spirit. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, biblical patience and sort of the the context in which it comes up to give us some idea on, as to how to apply it to our lives. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 12, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, and t take heed that ye not be consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh that are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us not walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So we have been looking at the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering today, next week gentleness or kindness, then goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Uh, let me make a couple of comments about, I think, an approach to this. And I wish you would pray for me. I, as you know, I had a sinus infection a couple weeks ago. And I always have sort of a, 
whenever something upsets my system, um, the lingering effect is usually a cough, and I had a pretty rough day of it yesterday. So I'm going to try to make it through both hours today. But you may see me sucking down some orange juice because that helps coat my throat. And hopefully I'll remember to hit my mute button when I have to <laughs> hack away. And talking with Charles about the approach to this particular passage, I think that the concern that he had, and then I'm going to take it in a little bit different direction, the, sh the concern that we shared is that to achieve these things, people will try to systematize a way to achieve this. And we see this as rampant in the church today, in the evangelical church, a rise in, in mysticism, which I would characterize its, its predominant characteristic, is an attempt to systematize the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, to, to make it, to put it down to a formula. And we see this come up in many, many different ways, all of which, in my view, are unbiblical. Uh, for example, there's a guy named Richard Foster who has written a book called Celebration of Discipline, and he talks about the spiritual disciplines, but essentially what he is promoting is a form of Eastern mysticism that you will uh, chant a word, you will repeat a word over and over through, you will put yourself essentially into an altered state of consciousness, and thereby you will achieve these things that, so you feel like the Spirit is doing something in your life. And this is, this is decidedly unbiblical. Uh, a current manifest, a current popular manifestation of this, um, and by the way, these, this mysticism is coming into the Catholic, or the Catholic Church. The evangelical church uh, is turning into something like the Catholic Church because of this influence of mysticism, and it comes in a lot through um, seminaries now have to, if they want to be accredited seminaries, under the uh, American Theological Society, they, it, I think it's called ATS. Uh, it, anyway, that accrediting agency requires seminaries to have spiritual formation programs. The problem with that, and I was on a board of a seminary for many, many years, for 25 years, the problem with that is that uh, while the the accrediting agency standards say that you should in, uh, introduce these spiritual formation programs consistent with the theological foundations and orientation of the institution, it has evolved into the place where everybody just kind of does the same thing. And the problem is that somehow Eastern mysticism and psychology have become the predominant thing in these programs. And that has led to a problem with mysticism, unbiblical mysticism, and the way that is instituted. Um, and I understand that people want everybody to be act well and do, do well, but the, this is bringing in Eastern mystical practices. It's now becoming one of the a big fad in the church is the, and I spoke about this a few months ago, called the Enneagram. You might have seen the circle with the triangles and the nine points. And essentially what it is, it's a way to systematize how you're improving. Uh, and it's a, it's, a myst, it's a mysticism practice. The big proponent of it is a guy named Richard Rohr, and I don't have time to go into him, but he, he is not Christian in the least, but he has become sort of the modern godfather of this Enneagram movement, which is sweeping over the evangelical church. You won't see it here at FBC, I can assure you, other than to hold it up as an example of something that is unbiblical. And Rohr is a mystic, he is in the transcendental meditation, uh, I mean the list goes on and on. And he believes in this great oneness, uh, Christ is oneness, it's it's bizarre, but he, if you look at all the books that have been written about the Enneagram, they will either cite Rohr directly or cite another author as a basis for this Enneagram and the, the evaluation methods that go along with it. They will cite Rohr as the authority. 
And this is, this is everywhere. I know North Point Church and Andy Stanley and the Catalyst Conference have been engaged in the Enneagram for a while. Uh, Catalyst Conference before that was engaged in contemplative prayer practices at their conference where they have six or seven or 10,000 pastors come. They were engaged in rank contemplative prayer mysticism. And if you bring it up, everybody says, oh, you're such a fuddy-duddy, you shouldn't worry about this. But the problem is, I think it's decidedly unbiblical because, as I said, it's trying to systematize the work of the Spirit and walking in the Spirit and living by the Spirit that is what is to be our goal and not to make it down into some formula that, well, okay, I did my 12-step, you know, discipline practice today and so I'm okay. I'm walking by the Spirit. That's not, that's not where we're going. So I think that, and if that's not where Charles was, he'll be up here in a couple of weeks to correct my, <laughs> uh, my thing. But that, that's, that's how I took it. So, okay, well, he said I agree, so um, let's pray. And uh, <laughs> No, so this, this is a big problem in the church, my friends. This is, um, it's how Steve Mitchell and I met, was our concerns over this. Uh, we shared that, and it is, sadly, it's only gotten worse in the many years that I've been studying this. And it eventually led to my, you know, separating, being asked to leave a seminary board, seminary and college board, because I had spoken out against it. But... Um, I stand by what I said. So let's look at long suffering today. Um, so long suffering, the NASB t uh, translated as patience. So you, wh whatever you want to call it is okay. And it's interesting. Uh, a few weeks ago, a couple months ago, I guess I spoke on James chapter five, and part of the passage there that I had that day dealt with quite a bit about patience. So I'm sort of going to, um, since the Lord seems to be sending me a message, I'm going to share with you the fact that um, patience is very important. And it's sort of central to a lot of what we do. And as we go through this and look at some of the passages just briefly at deal with patience, uh, I'm just going to look at the word that's used uh, in s uh, several New Testament passages and an Old Testament passage, at least in concept. And just to understand that the, the, the patience that we see in Scripture is very often expressed as God's patience. His patience in dealing with us to bring us to salvation. His long-suffering in that. And then his, what I would call his eschatological patience in allowing evil people to work and operate, but knowing that he will eventually take care of it. And in the world that we live in today, it's hard for us to exercise the patience that God exercises towards evil. Um, it's difficult, it's hard. I mean, look around, I mean, it, it's not hard to see that, uh, and I will talk a lot about this second hour, we live in a very uh, dark time. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, now, Joe Biden, when he was running, he said it would be a dark winter. I don't think he meant it in this particular context, since, frankly, he seems to be the uh, executor of the dark side a little bit these days, quite a bit these days. But we need to understand that we have to get the perspective of God in patience in dealing with this evil that we see running rampant in the world. It's interesting, when you look into Revelation chapter 6, there are um, 
people under the throne, in heaven under the throne, and they are crying, they are saying to the Lord, when are you going to avenge us? Now, it's a very interesting perspective because they're under the throne in heaven, and what do they want? They want to be avenged. And the, and the Lord says, what does he say? He says, wait a little while until your number is complete. Essentially, patience. I will take care of it in my time. So in James chapter 5, we see this admonition to the church. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. So we have just had a description that's going on here of the sort of the oppressive rich and people are upset and what about, you know, when are they going to get what is coming to them? And so the word here is a word called um, macrothumea, thumea, thumeti, thumeo, and it essentially means, um, one way to describe it is, don't ha it's not that you shouldn't have a fuse. <laughs> It says you should have a really long fuse instead of a short one. So that your reaction should not be immediate. You need to be patient. And there may be times that you will have to deal with something, but you are to exercise patience like God exercised patience. And the example that's used there in James, uh, another way to look at that word is taking a long time to boil. Um, It's not something that should be immediate. And then the example is used, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. So it's not something that will... You just need to be patient. And when the, the farmer is waiting for the fruit or the crop, he is patient. He, he can't force it. You can't make the corn grow faster. Even though you try, people try, but it requires patience. And then it says, um, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So there always seems to be this connection between our acting with patience, walking in the Spirit, recognizing though that the coming of the Lord is at hand, that the Lord that the Lord could come at any time. So there's a connection between the two. So most of the passages where this word um, macro thumeo is used is in the context of a eschatological waiting, waiting for the for the Lord to take care of it, waiting for the Lord to return. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it, uh, well, let's do 1 Peter, 2 Peter chapter, well, 1 Peter chapter 3 first, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So for maybe 300 years, from the time Noah was told to build the ark until the flood, God was patient. He did not exercise his judgment. And he lived and, and he waited a long time. In fact, Methuselah, you may remember this, Methuselah, by if you do the calculation, Methuselah died in the year of the flood. It's interesting that his name means his death shall bring. And so I believe that Methuselah's life, the length of it, the longest life that we have in recorded history in the Bible, what was it, 969 years that he lived? Um, I don't know what age he retired at. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, imagine the Medicare payments that had to be made for him if he retired at 65, 900. You've been at this 904 years, Methuselah. We're, we're, we're done with you. But his name, meaning his death shall bring, his death shall bring judgment, 
Isn't it ironic or interesting that Methuselah's life was the longest in the history of mankind? Showing that how long God is patient before he executes his judgment. And that is consistent with God's character. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 2 Peter chapter 3, it also talks again about this in an eschatological context. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant this, of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. He's patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall meet, melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works therein shall be burned up. So we see that this patience, and again back to James chapter 5, be patient therefore brethren unto the coming of the Lord. So we know that um, in the context of today, and with social media, I see a lot of people posting, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I posted it myself because this world is very tiresome now. It seems to be waxing worse and worse. I did an interview on a little internet program with my friend Tony called Minute to Midnight this week. And we, we talked about the fact that we did not, I did not think that the world was going that well right now. It's going according to God's plan, but it just from my perspective, things seem to be a bit out of control. That was up for 24 hours and YouTube censored it, took it down. Now I have no idea what it was that I said. So, so be it. But one of the things we talked about though was that, you know, it, it's difficult to see these things happening and wondering, okay, God, when are you going to take care of this? And as I said, second hour, I have some more examples of this. And again, we use the example of the, um, the farmer who waits for, um, who waits for the crop. And be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord uh, draweth nigh. The example then is used uh, in James chapter 5, verse 9. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And when we look at the lives of a lot of the prophets, we see, we see a prophet like Jeremiah, who gave the message of the Lord directly, boldly, truthfully. He was a true prophet because what he said came true. This is going to happen. Judgment is going to come, and you can't stop it. That was contrasted in passages like Jeremiah 23, where it said, if, if a prophet is coming and he's only giving you good news, don't worry about it, the day of the Lord's not here, it's not coming, everything's going to be fine, that might be an early indication that that's a false prophet that you're listening to. And we have many false prophets in the church today. I had a dream, I have a prophecy, I have a word of knowledge. And a lot of them related to the continuation of Donald Trump as president. He would be inaugurated again on January 20th. Was he? Uh, he was not. They're demonstrably false prophets. 
And boy, did I, have I ever been castigated by some people for saying that. How dare you speak against the Lord's anointed? They're not the Lord's anointed. They're false prophets by, their, by the words of their own mouths. Some have even taken to responding to that as well. Trump was inaugurated in the heavenlies, and you just don't know. I, yeah, I... So, Jeremiah was rejected and ignored. In Jeremiah chapter 7, it said, You shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. And Jeremiah 13, this wicked people who refuse to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts, and have gone at their other gods to serve them and to bow down to them, let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. Jeremiah 17, yet they did not listen or incline the ears, but stiffen their necks in order not to listen or take correction. Jeremiah 26, then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, this man deserves the sentence of death, speaking about Jeremiah, because he has prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your own ears. So the example that they, uh, of patience and long-suffering that's used are the prophets. They suffered affliction, but they were patient and waited for God to take care of it. And it didn't necessarily work out the way that they want, wanted. I mean, one prophet, the tradition is that Isaiah was sawn in half. That's probably not the way that Isaiah thought it would go. But God always promises that you will be patient and I will eventually take care of this and bring my judgment in my time. So that's the example of patience. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, Paul says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to com be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So that's, a, that's an orientation that we need to have when we walk by the Spirit that, listen, we may be suffering now, it may be very difficult, very dark, but we should always operate to the point where we want to be glorified by God. You might remember a couple of years ago, I used an example in one of my updates. And I don't know if I should have used this. I may have got somebody in trouble. But I was sent the video, and nobody told me, don't, don't dare share this. So, of course, being um, I, I was very moved by it. Because I thought it showed it was an example of patience in the midst of persecution. Uh, it was a church in a Middle Eastern country. And it was very interesting. They had, a move, they had a screen and a projector and a computer, and they had guys sitting at a, a table like we have here in one room here at the church with the soundboard and that type of thing and the projector, and they were playing the music, and they were leading worship. And there were people in that congregation that had had to leave the country where they grew up. They were a Christian, but they, and they were supposed to serve in the armed forces, but they couldn't do that because it was Muslim army. And the person fled because if they went into the army when they were in a battle, he would be killed because of his Christian, because he was a Christian. And yet, so there they are under persecution. These are, these are people who are persecuted. And it's a Middle Eastern country, so you can guess the predominant religion. But in the window was this neon cross. Sort of like, this is who we are. And so those people, when, when, you, when you hear stories about how they live and what they do, they really demonstrate biblical patience. They're in the midst of extreme persecution. Another example that's used in Scripture is, is Job. You know, Job had a lot of problems. He lost his family. He lost his wealth. And then he had friends that were not very helpful in the way they talked to him. But ultimately, in Job chapter 19, it showed that his perspective was long-term 
which led him. I mean, when, when you talk about a biblical character, you talk about the impulsiveness of Job, right? No, you talk about the patience of Job. He's the biblical example. And this is where he, this is his orientation. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I will see God. In fact, there are three people in Ezekiel chapter 14 that are described as extremely righteous. Now let me clarify, I mentioned something about Daniel, and I said, wow, Daniel had to play, Daniel prayed a prayer of repentance. I mean, you know, we think Daniel doesn't need to. And somebody kind of really crawled on my back about that, about, well, how dare you? Daniel needed to repent just like everybody else. In Ezekiel, Daniel is held up as an example of righteousness. Through these three men, Ezekiel 14, 14, through these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord. In other words, the judgment's coming on the land, and if, if Daniel, Noah, Daniel, and Job were here, it wouldn't save the country. Even if he had three righteous men like this, if I cause noise and beasts to pass through the land and they spoil it so that it be desolate that no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They shall only be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves shall be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut it off, to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. And their righteousness flows out of their patience. And when you look through the book of Daniel, you don't see Daniel trying to force the issue of getting back home to Israel. He is patient. He serves the Lord where he is. And as a result, Scripture identifies him as a very strong example of a righteous, a righteous dude. I mean, he was a great example. In Romans chapter 2, some of the other passages that we have that talk about long-suffering in the New Testament, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Paul fleshes this out a little bit more in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Christ Jesus might show forth what? all long-suffering, all patience, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Paul acknowledges, I was a bad guy. If anyone should have just been taken out, it should have been me. But God, in his mercy, was patient towards me, and eventually I was saved. And he had, a, as you know, a very fruitful ministry. He admonished Timothy in the last part of his last epistle. Timothy preached the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and doctrine. Now he doesn't say, don't reprove, don't rebuke, don't exhort. You're to do those, but you're to do that in the context of patience, long-suffering, and solid doctrine. Second Timothy chapter 3 also deals with this, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience. I had Jim read a passage, and while well, I don't think it uses this exact word, it does have the concept of 
living in a, a wicked, evil time. And when you're there, and, and even suffering persecution, the admonition of Scripture is, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. So God admonishes us over and over. First, we need to be patient because God was patient with us. And secondly, we need to be patient and wait for the Lord to deal with it. Now, I would like to put an exception here that it's okay to be impatient when you're dealing with airlines <laughs> and that sort of thing. I used to travel a lot, and believe me, I've had about everything, uh, uh, not a crash of a plane, but about everything up to that uh, in flying with these people. But I don't see any exception in Scripture that I'm not supposed to at least be patient with them as well. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It is how we demonstrate God's love towards us and how we are to act in love towards another person. And Galatians chapter 5 concludes with this, and we'll get into kindness next week. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So it's very important that we walk in the Spirit. You will not see, as I mentioned at the beginning, you will not see something about, we need to be very careful that we systematize how to live and walk in the Spirit. It's not what Scripture says. We need to be in the Word, and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not easy for us to do. We live in a culture where we, we think we can fix everything. But we are to walk in the Spirit. with patience and long-suffering. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We pray that you will um, make this message real in our hearts and lives this week, and that we will act with walk in the Spirit so that we can demonstrate patience and long-suffering to those around us. Give us opportunities to share the gospel and remember the patience that God had with us when we deserved far worse. Bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.